Happy Sabbath, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our divine service. I pray and hope that you are pleased with the Lord, you are in good health. Our short discussion today is entitled, Jacob's Time of Trouble. Jacob's Time of Trouble, Trust God. I take that again. Jacob's Time of Trouble, Trust God. I turn your attention to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 30. Jeremiah, chapter 30, verses 7. 10 and 11. I will read in your hearing from the King James Version. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Verse 10. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, thus says the Lord. Neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar thy seed from the land of thy captivity, and Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and, shall, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, says the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all the nations whither I have scattered thee, yet I will not make a full end of thee. I will correct thee in measure, I will not leave thee altogether unpunished. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his words. We are going to look at the life of Jacob, the experiences he went through, what struggles he had, and how we build up the concept of the time of trouble. We are going to study his uh, strengths, his weaknesses, but mostly we'll focus on his weaknesses because they speak to us as individuals in the last days. May the Lord add listen to the reading of his word as we begin. Great Controversy, page 621, paragraph 1. It thus says, Jacob's history is also an assurance that God will not cast off those who have been deceived, tempted, and betrayed into sin, but who have returned to him in true repentance. Satan seeks to destroy this class, and God will send his angels to comfort and protect them in the time of peril. The assaults of Satan are fierce and are determined. His delusions are terrible, but his eye, but the Lord's eye is upon the people, and his ears listen to their cries. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you this afternoon for the gift of life and this opportunity we have to consider your words and the life of Jacob. As we reach the climax of earth's history, the time of trouble is upon us. Strengthen us. Let us learn lessons from what Jacob went through so that we may apply them in our situation in preparation for your soon coming. This we pray in your mighty name. Amen. Genesis chapter 25, verses 24 through to 33. We are looking at the history of Jacob. Where does this chaos begin? Why is Jacob such an important figure in the time of trouble? And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, the Bible says, Behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red all over, like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And the, then came after his brother, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score years old when she bare them. And the boys grew up. Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, whilst Jacob was a plain man in the tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob because Jacob made a pottage. Esau came from the field and was faint and weak. And said to Jacob, Give me some of this pottage. Give me some of this soup. I pray thee. I am tired. I am weak. I need something to eat. Jacob took advantage of this situation, the Bible says, and said to him, Sell me this day your birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point of death. What profit shall this birthright have to me? And Jacob said, Swear me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. The great controversy in the context of Jacob and Esau is introduced as early as the womb. The children were fighting, the Bible says, to the point that when Esau came out, Esau came out with his heel being clutched in the hands of Jacob. 
The angel explained this to Rebecca, saying, the nation, the, the babies you have there are two nations that will be at war. One will overcome the other, but the other will rule over the other. The angel now goes on to explain further, to say, the younger shall rule over the older, and the older shall be subject to the younger. So this great controversy between two brothers, between two siblings, these two twins, started way back where? In the, in the womb. Esau was said to be a great hunter. Jacob, a stay-at-home son. So already the characters are worlds apart, yet they grow in the same family. Esau is going out hunting, he comes home tired, and he wants something to eat. He finds a young boy called Jacob. Give me some food, he says. I'm hungry, I want to eat. Jacob says to his brother, okay, I see you're hungry, but you have something that I want. What do you want? Esau says, I want your birthright. That all? Yes, I want your birthright. Swear me this day that you are going to give me what? Your birthright. Esau, in the fit of rage, Esau, as hungry as he is, says, fine, 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 take the birthright. What does it profit me? And it is at that moment we see how little regard Esau had for the birthright. To the point that he gave it up all because he was hungry. So what does Jacob do? Jacob takes advantage of his brother's uh, hunger and steals the birthright. Jacob deceives his father because later on we discover that Jacob went in with all forms of hair to give his father some meat. Jacob runs away from home. He finds himself in the house of Laban, his uncle, in our vernacular, Umalumewake. And they grow up together, grow up together. He eventually marries his two daughters. But towards the end of he, the relationship between him and Laban, what happens? He deceives Laban as well. Jacob performs many other acts of wickedness which may not be uh, documented in the Bible, but the Bible does say, for all have what? For all have sinned. So Jacob, when we look at his situation up to this point right now, Jacob has nothing good against his name. We don't even see any form of remorse in Jacob's activities. We don't even see any form of sorrow in Jacob's what? Uh, plans. But anyway, we go further. Jacob has a dream. Jacob has a dream. Now this is where you see how good God is. Whilst we are yet sinners, the Bible says, God dies for us. Listen to what the Bible says. Chapter 28, Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through to 15. It says this. And Jacob went out from Beersheba towards Haran, where he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because was, the sun was set, and he took some stones, and he fell asleep. He had a dream, and behold, a ladder came forth from the top down to the earth. And behold, angels were moving up and down the ladder. And behold, the Lord stood at the top of the ladder, and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, the Lord God of Isaac, your father. Where you lie, I will give you this land. Your seed shall benefit from this land. You and your seed shall be like the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread upon the west, upon the east, upon the south, upon the north. All of this shall belong to you. Behold, I am with thee and I will keep thee wherever you decide to go. Now have a look at this situation, ladies and gentlemen. Jacob has just messed up. Jacob has, has, has literally uh, done the worst of the worst. And God comes to him in that state of sin and says to him, I am with you. I will bless you. Everything that you see in front of you shall be yours. And you are saying, hang on a minute. Lord, I have put yourself in Jacob's shoes. I have messed up. And here you are saying you're going to bless me? God sometimes doesn't make sense. To try and understand him will just cause you headaches. Accept the blessing and praise the Lord. Desire of Ages, page 311. Christ is the ladder that Jacob saw. The base resting on the earth. The topmost reaching to the gates of heaven to the very threshold of God's glory. It, if the ladder were to fail by a single step, then all of us would be doomed. But Christ reaches us where we are. 
Here is Jacob in the wilderness. He's sleeping, and Christ makes the initiative to reach Jacob. My Bible tells me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Who initiated the relationship? It was God. It was God who initiated. It was God who gave. And this is demonstrated in the life of Jacob when he's having that dream that night. It is God who made the ladder. It is God who approached Jacob. Jacob is in a state of sin. 20 years later, what happens? Remember, this is Jacob. So far, we have seen no remorse. We have seen no conversion. We have just seen a life of deceit, a life of cheating, a life of lies, and a life of robbery. This is what we have seen so far in the scriptures on the life of Jacob. Yet God says, I will bless you. Let's continue. Chapter 31, verse 3 and verse 13. The Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers, to thy kindred. I will be with thee. Jacob remembers what happened when he last saw his brother. He remembers that he deceived his brother. And now this God is saying, Go back to that brother whom you deceived. He will kill me. Jacob possibly thinks, he will hurt me. I am not a family man. I have got children. He will take them and become slaves. God says, I will be with you. Remember the promise I made to you 20 years ago, that wherever you go, I will bless you. Praise be to Jacob, he obeyed. Sometimes God asks us to do things which don't make sense. Of course, they won't make sense to us humans. But the hallmark of faith is what? obeying God even if it doesn't make sense. God continues to remind him, say, where you slept that night, where you met me on the, uh, the, the ladders, I made a promise to you that that land will be yours. I made a promise to you that I will be with you. I am here to keep that promise. Jacob decides to leave uh, Paradan, the, 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 the land of, of Laban, in obedience to divine direction. However, there was lots of misgivings. He remembered what he had done. He retraced his steps. Every wicked thing he had done comes back to memory. And as he is walking that long journey, his heart sinks. His heart becomes heavy. I can almost feel Jacob going back home to face the family that he so betrayed. He knows for a fact that the long exile, the 20-year exile, is a result of his own sin. This he knows. And now he has to go and face the music. As he now approaches his native land, the spirit of prophecy says, everything now comes back in a great flash. All the evil. I can imagine the pain he's going through mentally. I can imagine the anguish that he's experiencing. I can imagine to say, this God, has he truly forgiven me? Because I know my brother has not. How am I going to handle this situation? When we started this discussion, the great controversy began in the womb. Now the great controversy has grown into a mental battle. The remembrance of sin versus the remembrance of God's blessings, both of which are now calling for your full attention. Which one do you think Jacob decided to listen to first? I believe he chose to listen to God's blessings because he says, I will trust the Lord even though it does not make sense. I have gone this far already with him. As Jacob is on his way back, he's sad, he's low, he's discouraged, wondering if his sin has been forgiven. At the same time, as Jacob is going through this mental anguish, Satan is doing something in the mind of Esau. He is marshalling up Esau to prepare Esau to go and fight his brother Jacob. So Esau hears that Jacob is on, on his way. Esau says, guys, this guy, this brother of mine I, I told you about, he's coming here. Let's go and kill him. Satan reminds Jacob of his old sins, thus discouraging him. As we approach the time of trouble in our own individual capacities, in our corporate capacities as a church, in our situation as a state, when we reach the time of trouble, Satan will also remind you of your own sins. And then when you now look down upon yourself, you say, for sure, has God really forgiven me? You'll ask yourself that very, very difficult question. God is saying, trust my forgiveness. 
How does this apply to us today? Jacob was permitted by the Lord to go through this mental anguish. Jacob was, was taught to trust God that the promise given to him 20 years before was still valid today. It is true, Jacob, you have sinned. It is true, church member, you have sinned. It is true, brother Kitzo, you have sinned. But God expects you to do what? To trust his forgiving power. Satan accuses his people on account of their sins. The Lord permits such accusations to take place. Read the story of, of Joshua in the book of Zechariah. He says he had filthy garments. The Lord allowed Joshua to go through that experience. But at the end of the story, what does Zechariah say? He says, the Lord has forgiven you, Zechariah. Give him new garments. Your confidence in God will be tested. Your faith in him will be strained. Your firmness will be shaken. God expects you to review your past. And as you review your past, you get to see how ugly you are inside, isn't it? But God is saying, despite that, do you believe that I can forgive you? You are fully aware of your weakness. You are fully aware of your unworthiness. And Satan endeavors to take advantage of these weaknesses that you've identified to say, desert the Lord. He won't forgive you. But God expects you to what? To trust his forgiveness. What other instrument will Satan use to discourage you and me? Satan is not going to kill that easily. You're going through mental anguish, I know. But Satan will go a step further. He will use those closest to you. He will use your close friends, your families, to remind you of how much of a sinner you are. He will use your friends to say, ah, well, we know your stories. So apart from your own mental recollection, your friends now remind you. However, Jacob has another problem. So far, we have seen the mental anguish that Jacob goes through. So far, we have seen that the friends and families are reminding Jacob, reminding you, reminding me of our sins. But there is yet a second problem. What's the problem? Genesis 27, verse 41 and 42. Genesis 27, verse 41 and 42 has this to say. Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father had blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, get that, Esau said what? In his heart, the days of mourning for my father I at hand, I will slay my brother Jacob. What were Esau's intentions? To wait for the father to die so that he would what? Kill Jacob. Almost similar to parable of the prodigal son, whereby they waited for the father to die so that he could take all the money. So, Jake, so Esau says to himself that I'm waiting for my father to die and I'll do what? I'll kill my brother. But listen to what the Bible says. This is quite interesting. This is where you can see God's protection. Esau said this way in his heart. Assumably, nobody was listening. But listen to this. These words of Esau the elder son were told to Rebekah. Who heard Esau say these things? Yet the Bible says these things were said in his heart. Who heard those things? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But it does say that God was fully aware of Esau's intentions. And because of that, Rebekah heard the intentions of Esau and said to Jacob, run away. Behold, your brother wants to kill you. That's number one. Blessing number one. The Lord saw the intentions of Esau. And the intentions were to kill Jacob. Number two, the Lord saw the intentions of Esau to wait for the father to die. Praise be to God. Isaac did not die. Isaac, it took many, many years for Isaac to die. So whatever plans Esau had to kill Jacob had to be deferred until Isaac died. And Isaac did not die. It took quite a while. So God was fully aware and he preserved Isaac for the sake of who? Of Jacob. Why? Because the angel told Rebekah when they were pregnant, the younger will be master over the older. God had to keep that promise. So for 20 years, Esau is moved by Satan to kill Jacob. For 20 years, Esau is nursing a hate. For 20 years, Esau is out to, 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 to build a lineage of people who will hate Jacob. For 20 years, However, Jacob is aware of this, and now they have to meet. 
Jacob is aware of this. That night, Jacob made a prayer. And he prayed to the Lord, I am not worthy of the least of these mercies. And of all truth, thou hast shown thy servant. This is the first time we are seeing Jacob saying sorry. 20 years later. This is the first time we are seeing some remorse in the life of Jacob. This is the first time we are seeing Jacob feeling sorry for his sins. That night when Jacob uh, has prayed, unlike the first time, an angel does come and they have a fight. The fight is so fierce. It brawls through the whole night until sunrise and the angel says, let me go. Jacob says, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And it's at that moment on, Jacob has his name changed from Jacob to Israel. God has forgiven you. God remembered his what? His promise. Whilst Jacob is having that fight with the angel, the Holy Spirit is doing something else in the minds and hearts of Esau. I want to submit to the church today that whilst Jacob was having that fight, the Holy Spirit had visited Esau to say, I know you want to kill your brother. I know you've gone after him. I know you've set up a full army just to kill him. Don't do so. Why? The very thing that you wanted, the money, the land, the gold, you name it, the treasury, he is coming with it to give it to you. So what's the point of killing him? And my Bible tells me when Jacob and Esau met, People expected that it was going to be a bloodbath. Alas, it was hugs and kisses. They had a party that night. They celebrated. Jacob came with his family and said to Esau, here, here are your kindred. Here is the land. Here is the gold. Here are the camels. Here are the cows. You name it. It's all yours. I stole it from you, my brother. I stole it from you unfairly. I wounded you emotionally. I took advantage of your hunger that day. I want to return what belongs to you. Now read the Bible very carefully. That night, 20 years ago, when Jacob had the dream, it says that God said to him, the land where you are on, I will give it to you. Guess what Jacob did? He even surrendered that piece of land to Esau. And you'll see why in a moment. So Jacob and Esau have, have reconciled. So you think everything is now all rosy, rosy. Alas, there is one more problem. This time it doesn't affect Jacob. But it's a strong lesson that we have to take seriously. We saw that Jacob for 20 years, sorry, Esau for 20 years was nursing a hate. A hate so bad that it led to some events in the book of Exodus, chapter 17. As we now come to the conclusion, it led to some, some challenges which took place in chapter 17. I turn your attention to verse 8. Exodus chapter 17, verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in the land of Rephidim. Why am I throwing in this story all of a sudden? Who is Amalek? What's the big deal about Amalek? Remember what had just happened. Israel, this is three, four hundred years later, has just come out of Egypt. They have crossed the Red Sea and are now looking towards getting to Canaan. What's Canaan, by the way? The land that was promised many years ago. Keep that in mind. Amalek has heard that these guys are now out of Egypt, have crossed the Red Sea, and are coming. And in verse 8, we are told Amalek fought Israel. Praise be to God, Amalek was defeated. Why is this a big deal? Let's go to Genesis 36, verse 12. Genesis 36, verse 12. Who is Amalek and why is he important in this story? Verse 12. I'll start from verse 8. And Esau dwelt in Mount Seir. What's Mount Seir? The place where God had promised Jacob. So Esau has now dwelt there because Jacob has given him the land that he had, he had stolen uh, by, default, by, by, by defaulting him. Verse 11, verse, verse 9. And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. They are the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau. 
Ruel, the son of Bashemath, the wife of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz, right? The sons of Eliphaz were Timan, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kinaz. These are the sons of Elimaz. Elimaz, the son of Esau. Timna was a concubine to Eliphaz. Right? So now we've got a new person here. Timna, a concubine to who? To Eliphaz. Eliphaz, the son of who? Of Esau. Verse 12. And Esau's son bare Eliphaz Amalek. Did you hear that clearly? Eliphaz and the concubine had a son. And what is the son's name? Amalek. Bible scholars suggest that Esau, Eliphaz, Timna, and Amalek all stayed in the same tent. So what do you think Esau was doing? Esau was telling his children, over that 20-year period, I have a brother, and this brother pissed me off. This brother defaulted me. I hate this brother. If any of you see this guy, kill him. I want to kill him myself. So for 20 years, he was nursing this hate among, within himself, within his family. And eventually, Amalek became the father of what we call today the Amalekites, the same Amalekites that attacked Israel when they came from the Red Sea. It was for that reason, it was for that reason they attacked because there was a, a hatred that was nursed for 20 years despite the fact that the brothers had reconciled. And this is a lesson for us as parents that some things we may not feel or see the effects today, but our generations will feel it three, four, five hundred years down the line. Let's be careful what we say to our children concerning our siblings. Let's be careful what we say uh, to our children, because what you think is just a temporary thing will have adverse effects down the line. Unfortunately for the Amalekites, they were eradicated at the hand of Joshua. You find the story in Exodus chapter 17. A whole nation, because of the hatred of one man, eradicated. Ladies and gentlemen, as we come to the end of our, our discussion, keep these points in mind. God's promise is a valid promise all the way down your history. God's promise, we saw it being filled in the life of Jacob despite it being delayed. God's promise, we see it being fulfilled centuries after Jacob's death because Israel was attacked and God still protected Israel because of the promise that was made. When God says he forgives you, he forgives you indeed. Jacob had sinned. You and I have sinned. When we come to him, in faith and in assurance that he can forgive, he will forgive. Our opening verse was Jeremiah chapter 30. And Jeremiah chapter 30 had this to say, that I will not make an end of you, Jacob, altogether. I will discipline you in measure, but all nations around you will fall by the wayside. I'm paraphrasing. And this is our experience today. Yes, we are sinners. But the Lord has promised to forgive and even bless. He will protect you during the time of trouble on condition you trust him. You trust his forgiving power. We will go through this experience. Yes, we will. But look at the life of Jacob. It is your life to claim as well because God has promised. Early writings, page 284. As the saints left the cities and villages, they were pursued by the wicked who sought to slay them. But the swords that were raised to kill God's people, you and me, fell as powerless as straw. The angels had shielded the saints. As they cried day and night for deliverance, their cry came up to the Lord. What made Jacob uh, uh, succeed? Prayer and trust. Unwilling, an, unwillingness to, sorry, an unwillingness to pray and agonize will lead to our own demise. We must make it a habit to trust the Lord. We must make it a habit to trust him now so that when it comes to the time of trouble, we will trust him then. May the good Lord bless you today. Jesus is still in the temple ministering for you, ministering for me, so that when the time of trouble does come, just like in the life of Jacob, we will be ready to stand. I pray that you have a closer walk with Jesus as a result of this message. And I pray that should you find yourself in a time of trouble, should I find myself in a time of trouble, we will all survive. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his words. Shall we pray?
Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of life. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for caring for us because you are our Father, you are our friend. We pray for strength to overcome. We pray for forgiveness of sin. And we pray for a closer walk with you. Hear our prayer this afternoon. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you.